Edmund Burke was an Anglo-Irish statesman born in Dublin, as well as an author, orator, political theorist and philosopher who, after moving to London, served as a member of Parliament for many years in the House of Commons with the Whig Party. Burke is remembered mainly for his support of the cause of the American revolutionaries, Catholic emancipation, the impeachment of Warren Hastings from the East India Company, and for his later objections about the French Revolution, the latter leading to his becoming the leading figure within the conservative faction of the Whig Party, which he dubbed the Old Whigs, as opposed to the pro-French Revolution, New Whigs, led by Charles James Fox. In the 19th century Burke was praised by both conservatives and liberals, subsequently in the 20th century, becoming widely regarded as the philosophical founder of conservatism. Early life Burke was born in Dublin, Ireland. His mother Mary Enniacuti Nagel was a Roman Catholic who hailed from a Declasse County Cork family, whereas his father, a successful solicitor, Richard, was a member of the Church of Ireland. It remains unclear whether this is the same Richard Burke who converted from Catholicism. The Burke dynasty descends from an Anglo-Norman knight surnamed Der Burke who arrived in Ireland in 1185 following Henry II of England's 1171 invasion of Ireland. Burke adhered to his father's faith and remained a practicing Anglican throughout his life. Unlike his sister Juliana who was brought up as and remained a Roman Catholic. Later, his political enemies repeatedly accused him of having been educated at the Jesuit College of St. Omer, near Calais, France, and of harboring secret Catholic sympathies at a time when membership of the Catholic Church would disqualify him from public office. As Burke told Francis Crewe, Mr. Burke's enemies often endeavoured to convince the world that he had been bred up in the Catholic faith, and that his family were of it, and that he himself had been educated at St. Omer, but this was false, as his father was a regular practitioner of the law at Dublin, which he could not be unless of the established church. And it so happened that though Mr. B. was twice at Paris, he never happened to go through the town of St. Omer. Once an MP, Burke was required to take the oath of allegiance and abjuration, the oath of supremacy, and declare against transubstantiation. No Catholic MP in Ireland is known to have done so in the 18th century. Although never denying his Irishness, Burke often described himself as an Englishman. According to historian J. C. D. Clarke, this was in an age before Celtic nationalism sought to make Irishness and Englishness incompatible. As a child he sometimes spent time away from the unhealthy air of Dublin with his mother's family in the Blackwater Valley in County Cork. He received his early education at a Quaker school in Ballater, County Kildare, some 67 kilometres from Dublin. He remained in correspondence with his schoolmate from there, Mary Ledbetter, the daughter of the school's owner, throughout his life. In 1744, Burke started at Trinity College Dublin, a Protestant establishment, which up until 1793, did not permit Catholics to take degrees. In 1747, he set up a debating society, Edmund Burke's Club, which in 1770, merged with TCD's historical club to form the College Historical Society. It is the oldest undergraduate society in the world. The minutes of the meetings of Burke's Club remain in the collection of the Historical Society. Burke graduated from Trinity in 1748. Burke's father wanted him to read law, and with this in mind he went to London in 1750, where he entered the Middle Temple, before soon giving up legal study to travel in continental Europe. After eschewed the law, he pursued a livelihood through writing. Early writing The late Lord Bolingbroke's Letters on the Study and Use of History was published in 1752 and his collected works appeared in 1754. This provoked Burke into writing his first published work, A Vindication of Natural Society, A View of the Miseries and Evils Arising to Mankind, appearing in spring 1756. 
Burke imitated Bolingbroke's style in ideas in a reductio ad absurdum of his argument for atheistic rationalism, demonstrating their absurdity. Burke claimed that Bolingbroke's arguments against revealed religion could apply to all social and civil institutions as well. Lord Chesterfield and Bishop Warburton initially thought that the work was genuinely by Bolingbroke rather than a satire. All the reviews of the work were positive, with critics especially appreciative of Burke's quality of writing. Richard Hurd believed that Burke's imitation was near perfect and that this defeated his purpose. An ionist should take care by a constant exaggeration to make the ridicule shine through the imitation, whereas this vindication is everywhere enforced, not only in the language and on the principles of L. Bol, but with so apparent, or rather so real an earnestness, that half his purpose is sacrificed to the other. A minority of scholars have taken the position that, in fact, Burke did write the vindication in earnest later disowning it only for political reasons. In 1757, Burke published a treatise on aesthetics, a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, which attracted the attention of prominent continental thinkers such as Dennis Diderot and Immanuel Kant. It was his only purely philosophical work, and when asked by Sir Joshua Reynolds and French Lawrence to expand it 30 years later, Burke replied that he was no longer fit for abstract speculation. On 25 February 1757, Burke signed a contract with Robert Dodsley to write a history of England from the time of Julius Caesar to the end of the reign of Queen Anne, its length being 80 quarto sheets, nearly 400,000 words. It was to be submitted for publication by Christmas 1758. Burke completed the work to the year 1216 and stopped. It was not published until after Burke's death, being included in an 1812 collection of his works, entitled An Essay Towards an Abridgment of the English History. G.M. Young did not value Burke's history and claimed that it was demonstrably a translation from the French. Lord Acton, on commenting on the story that Burke stopped his history because David Hume published his said, it is ever to be regretted that the reverse did not occur. During the year following that contract, with Dodsley, Burke founded the Influential Annual Register, a publication in which various authors evaluated the international political events of the previous year. The extent to which Burke contributed to the Annual Register is unclear. In his biography of Burke, Robert Murray quotes the Register as evidence of Burke's opinions. Yet Philip Magnus in his biography does not cite it directly as a reference. Burke remained the chief editor of the publication until at least 1789 and there is no evidence that any other writer contributed to it before 1766. On 12 March 1757, Burke married Jane Mary Nugent, daughter of Dr. Christopher Nugent, a Catholic physician who had provided him with medical treatment him at Bath. Their son Richard was born on 9 February 1758, an elder son, Christopher, died in infancy. Burke also helped raise a ward, Edmund Nagel, the son of him maternal cousin orphaned in 1763. At about this same time, Burke was introduced to William Gerard Hamilton. When Hamilton was appointed Chief Secretary for Ireland, Burke accompanied him to Dublin as his private secretary, a position he held for three years. In 1765 Burke became private secretary to the Liberal Whig statesman, Charles Marquis of Rockingham, then Prime Minister of Great Britain, who remained Burke's close friend and associate until his untimely death in 1782. Rockingham also introduced Burke as a Freemason, Member of Parliament. In December 1765 Burke entered the House of Commons of the British Parliament as member for Wendover a pocket borough in the gift of Lord Fermanagh, later 2nd Earl Verney and a close political ally of Rockingham, having delivered his maiden speech. William Pitt the Elder said Burke had spoken in such a manner as to stop the mouths of all Europe, and that the Commons should congratulate itself on acquiring such a member. The first great subject Burke addressed was the controversy with the American colonies. 
which soon developed into war and ultimate separation. In reply to the 1769 Grenville Light pamphlet, The Present State of the Nation, he published his own pamphlet on observations on a late state of the nation. Surveying the finances of France, Burke predicts some extraordinary convulsion in that whole system. During the same year, with mostly borrowed money, Burke purchased Gregory's, a 600-acre estate near Beaconsfield, although the estate included saleable assets such as artworks by Titian. Gregory's proved a heavy financial burden in the following decades and Burke was never able to repay its purchase price in full. His speeches and writings having made him famous led to the suggestion that he was the author of the Letters of Junius. At about this time, Burke joined the circle of leading intellectuals and artists in London of whom Samuel Johnson was the central luminary. This circle also included David Garrick, Oliver Goldsmith, and Joshua Reynolds. Edward Gibbon described Burke as the most eloquent and rational madman that I ever knew. Although Johnson admired Burke's brilliance, he found him a dishonest politician. Burke took a leading role in the debate regarding the constitutional limits to the executive authority of the king. He argued strongly against unrestrained royal power and for the role of political parties in maintaining a principled opposition capable of preventing abuses, either by the monarch or by specific factions within the government. His most important publication in this regard was his thoughts on the cause of the present discontents of 23 April 1770. Burke identified the discontents as stemming from the secret influence of a neo-Tory group he labelled as the King's Friends, whose system, comprehending the exterior and interior administrations, is commonly called, in the technical language of the court, double cabinet. Britain needed a party with an unshaken adherence to principle and attachment to connection against every allurement of interest. Party divisions, whether operating for good or evil, are things inseparable from free government. During 1771, Burke wrote a bill that, if passed, would have given juries the right to determine what was libel. Burke spoke in favour of the bill but it was opposed by some, including Charles James Fox thus not becoming law. Fox, when introducing his own bill in 1791 in opposition, repeated almost verbatim the text of Burke's bill without acknowledgement. Burke also was prominent in securing the right to publish debates held in Parliament. Speaking in a parliamentary debate on the prohibition on the export of grain on 16 November 1770, Burke argued in favour of a free market in corn. There are no such things as a high and a low price that is encouraging and discouraging. There is nothing but a natural price which grain brings at an universal market. In 1772, Burke was instrumental in the passing of the repeal of certain laws Act 1772, which repealed various old laws against dealers and forestallers in corn. In the annual register for 1772, Burke condemned the partition of Poland. He saw it as the first very great breach in the modern political system of Europe and as upsetting the balance of power in Europe. In 1774, Burke was elected member for Bristol, at the time, England's second city, and a large constituency with her genuine electoral contest. In May 1778, Burke supported a parliamentary motion revising restrictions on Irish trade. His constituents, citizens of the great trading city of Bristol, however urged Burke to oppose free trade with Ireland. Burke resisted their protestations and said, If, from this conduct, I shall forfeit their suffrages at an ensuing election, it will stand on record an example to future representatives of the Commons of England. That one man at least had dared to resist the desires of his constituents when his judgment assured him they were wrong. Burke published two letters to gentlemen of Bristol on the bills relative to the trade of Ireland, in which he espoused some of the chief principles of commerce, such as the advantage of free intercourse between all parts of the same kingdom, dot the evils attending restriction and monopoly, dot and that the gain of others is not necessarily our loss. 
but on the contrary an advantage by causing a greater demand for such wares as we have for sale. Burke also supported the attempts of Sir George Savile to repeal some of the penal laws against Catholics. Burke also called capital punishment, the butchery which we call justice, in 1776 and in 1780 he condemned the use of the pillory for two men, convicted for attempting to practice sodomy. This support for unpopular causes, notably free trade with Ireland and Catholic emancipation, led to Burke losing his seat in 1780. For the remainder of his parliamentary career, Burke represented Malton, another pocket borough under the Marquess of Rockingham's patronage.